Thank you. It's um, a real pleasure to be here. We're going to try something a little different. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Alex Encinas and Christian Magallanes. And um, they are part of our team, and I want you all to get to know them. Um, and they're going to be reaching out to you. Um, and I'll explain how. But we're going to try and do a demo of the latest beta test of our some of the things we're working on on our uh, website. So um, I'm going to show a couple of slides. Then Alex is going to take you through what Christian is going to be doing over there on the computer as if you were the person on the computer. And then we'll go back to a few more slides. And I'm going to give you some of the results of the survey that we just ran, which is really exciting. And um, maybe we could have the first couple of slides here. Um, this is really directed at the families. Um, we, the power we have as a group, I'm sure we've already gotten this message tonight. Um, we have real power to change the world. And Tracy said it right, moms and dads can change the world. So what we're really trying to do is provide a mechanism by which we can accelerate that change. And you will be the entities and the activities, the agencies by which that change occurs. And we have not yet described this disorder fully. We are just beginning to describe it. We need to see the full spectrum of symptoms that children present. Um, we don't yet know if adults have SCN8A uh, disorders because we're not looking. But there could be other phenotypes, um, which would be a great help to Xenon because they need to test their drugs on adults. But in the meantime, we're going to try and uh, describe um, the children that have this disorder, all the phenotypes, the genetic variants that these children have, and we're, begin we're going to be looking for associations between the genotypes, the phenotypes, and the phenotypes and the phenotypes, and describe the patterns that we see. So um, the next slide, um, I guess I have, I'm going to turn this off, right, if I do something. Um, I think this is the one to go forward. So. I want to start out by saying uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you and for the generous support that the CUTE syndrome has provided, which is for Elliot. And I would also like to acknowledge the University of Arizona has been a huge help in supporting us with the informatics, the bioinformatics, the computer technology behind what we're doing. They found this to be a compelling project. Everywhere SCNA goes, people find it compelling. 50% of the Xenon, when I went up to visit Xenon and the, you know, the, the lecture room was full. You, it was palpable how much interest and excitement and dedication they had for this, for this for SCNA day. It's, it's a magical, it's the magical cute syndrome. Um, and then, of course, I want to uh, mention that we are now working with Xenon, and Xenon is supporting Alex in doing what she's going to do as the liaison between our website and the families directly. So we're going to try and make this as easy as possible to collect the data that we are collecting. All right, so the next slide. Oh, I, I, I arranged that. That's right. So I've just sort of told you what it is. There's a website, scna.net, that we've built. And the purpose, as I've sort of been describing already, to establish a patient database of genetic variants and phenotypes longitudinally. It's very important that we can collect data over and over again. We want to make it easy to go back, and you'll get reminders on when it's time to go back um, and add data. Uh, generate knowledge of the natural history, evolution, risk, outcomes, and genetic basis of this disorder. Accelerate progress and development of new AEDs, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, and treatments. And facilitate collaboration among families, doctors, and researchers. And really what we're going to talk about tonight is how we can facilitate that collaboration among these stakeholders. <clears throat> okay, why, why should I do the, participate? Well, it's kind of obvious, but I wrote down some reasons just to, for those who aren't convinced. First of all, we might be able to connect you through the mutation that your child has to other families that share that mutation and then allow the connectivity between families with the same, with child with the same mutation and you can learn from each other. And we already know that that's happening, even if you don't share the same mutation, but even more interestingly when you do. Um, provide the most up-to-date information to doctors and scientists. The doctors who are seeing this disorder for the first time need us to tell them more about it. And I know Dr. Mandy Harris has been a godsend for our, our community 
um, we need more doctors out there like, like, like Mandy, and there are many others in this room that are, 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 are just doing exactly what she is doing. But doctors don't always tell the patients what they don't know. I'm making a guess here. Maybe that's not completely true, and it's certainly not true in all cases, but we would like to provide a mechanism which doc, by which doctors can talk to doctors or go to a place to get all the information they need to understand what this disorder is. Provide a complete description of the highly variable symptoms of SCNA epilepsy and encephalopathy. Discover relationships between different mutations, clinical symptoms, and outcomes. Aid in the design of new pharmaceuticals that specifically target your child's mutation. By building this database and understanding and describing this in, in, in minute detail, we will be aiding uh, and providing the, the families and the networks that we're building will be critically important for clinical trials. And, and that's why uh, we formed a partnership with Xenon. Um, critical need to enroll as many participants as possible to achieve statistical significance. I'm gonna give you some numbers tonight from our survey of 80 respondents and we're finding I would say we have low numbers, but they're supporting some very interesting patterns, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll describe that to you at the end. So without further ado, I would like to see if we can um, get the internet working and let you guys take the next few minutes to explain how you can go to the site and um, see our new dashboard and things like that, which will um, provide you feedback for, for what you're interested in. Okay. Um, so the whole idea behind the uh, the registry and having a patient and or doctor that work is that oh. well, first, as you saw at the top, uh, when you first go to the website, if you don't have an account, you're just considered a guest. So you can see all of the public uh, level information, um, you know, stuff about drugs, uh, information uh, about uh, the genetic variants that are that you might share with somebody else. But when it comes down to the more specific, sort of more private uh, levels, such as the, the family forum and getting to the registry, that requires a, default, a different level of security. So we have two levels of security. The first one is to first create an account. Um, and to create an account, first thing you would do is go to registry. Um, if you haven't ever been to the site, if you don't have an account, if you're not registered, um, the first thing you would see uh, a little bit of a summary of what Michael talked about, why you should participate, what's going to happen to your data. And then at the bottom of this, it uh, gives you the option to create an account. And this is that first level of security. So when you go to sign up, it's going to uh, ask you for some very basic information. Uh, what username do you want to use? What's the password you'd like to use for the site? Really just creating this, uh, this basic framework uh, for your account. Um, once you get through that, like I said, um, there will be options to uh, write where you're from, location-wise, that helps us build a location map, maybe even connect families in uh, similar areas who might uh, have SEA mutations. Um, the, uh, there's a, the second level of security, like I mentioned, there's two levels. The second level is once you've created an account, um, we're going to ask you to fill out a membership form. This just lets us collect data to show that you, um, that you do have a relative with an A mutation. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that the only people who are able to access these private family forms or to fill out the registry questionnaire are individuals who have the A mutation. Um, so uh, back a little bit back, when you first create an account, you would agree to some rules and policies. Um, and they're just basic guidelines. Um, to follow on the family forum and on the site. And then this is the to register as a new user, not yet a member. Um, and then you would create the user at the bottom. So to get back to why we have uh, two levels of security, like I said, we want to make sure that only people with uh, who are affected by AA are seeing these private um, forums and filling out the registry. It also allows us to have different types of accounts. So we, we're looking to have a patient account and we're also looking to have a doctor account. That will help us 
like uh, Michael talked about, to allow doctors to talk with other doctors and see uh, different forms and be able to talk on a different level that maybe the patients don't need to be involved with or maybe you guys want to have conversations that you, know, you don't want your doctors to see or stuff like that. Um, and that would also allow um, for, in our registry, if we can get it to, um, to get to it, but um, it will allow, uh, once you filled out the uh, registry on our site, there's a, a new innovative thing that we're working to do where we get your doctor to sign off and or validate sort of the results you put. And it's really just because when we go to publish these results, a lot of times it comes with a little bit of pushback because, uh, you know, it's self-reported. That there's not, uh, it's not coming from a, uh, a scientific and or, you know, a doctor saying this is what happened. It's coming from the, the parents. Um, and so this, the sign-off from the doctor will allow us to really just make the data that you provide to us really validated and will allow us to publish it and have that much more weight. So this is the membership form that you would fill out as a, uh, once you have become a user, you've created an account. This is the membership form you would fill out, your name, your relation to the individual with the aid and mutation, uh, email, city, country. Uh, and then it would also collect, uh, more towards the bottom, it would collect the information about um, the name of the individual who has the AA. Uh, they would also collect their date of birth, the age over the, at which the seizure started. Um, and then towards the bottom, it also collects the specific mutation. Um, we built it in so you have to put in a muta mutation in order to get confirmed as a member. If you don't have it, there's also a box that you would check to show that you don't have a mutation. And the, the only difference with that is then it gets routed to us and we would just contact you and confirm that yes, you do have a, an individual who's affected by 8A, maybe you don't have a report or you can't remember, um, but we just like to vet those out again. We just want to make sure that the people who get the access to some of these more private sections are really supposed to be there. Excuse me, do they not yeah. get access? So you contact them and then do you wait for the report? Or yeah, then we just sort of have to find out the reason why they don't have the information, if they're going to get it soon. It's kind of like what you have to do when, yeah. you, when people contact you. you know, okay, so okay. Yeah. So it's kind of, so then you'll get notified and then you'll start to contact them and exactly. try and seek that information or help right. obtain it if they're unable to. Right. Okay. Yeah. And we try to do that as quickly as possible. Um, Christian is the one who gets most of the notifications and as soon as we get that, we try and respond almost immediately. To really facilitate the to get them in and on the family form and stuff like that. So Christian, where do we stand? <laughs> so right now we created an account and we also fill out the membership form. Once you fill out the membership form, uh, the next step is to log in again. Okay. Is to log in and um, after that we are going to show you new features as a patient, registered patient, within a patient account. Okay. All right, so uh, this is showing after you submitted the membership form, you have an account, you're ready to go. And so what's going to change a little bit, and these changes are very new, if you've been on the site, if you've been to the registry, this will all be very new. So when you click on registry, um, we're now going to be implementing this dashboard. It's very much like your profile on the website. It gives you the ability to see what questionnaires we have on the site for you to fill out, um, and, as well as go to a lot of the other uh, resources on our website. So if you just click on the registry uh, real quick. And so this takes you directly to our disclosure for the, uh, for the registry. Basically outlines this is IRB approved, what we're going to do with your data, that we're going to keep it safe, we're not going to give out your information, it's going to be all de-identified, so your data is safe. Um, it does require at the bottom for you to agree to allow your data to be used for research purposes. So once you hit agree at the bottom, it then takes you into the uh, registry so you can start filling out the questionnaire. This is a very, very extensive questionnaire. Uh, we've broken it into eight different modules.
That way, you don't have to feel like you have to fill it out all at once. And the really cool thing about this is you can save it, come back to it later. If there's a question you can't remember, if, there, if the data is somewhere else, you can always save it and then at uh, another time come back, fill it out, and hit submit at that point. Like I said, this is just, um, the, he's going through the, the different modules. You can hit continue to go through each module all at, at, module all at once, um, or you can go back and, um, like I said, come back at a later time when either you have more time or there's, uh, you have the data available to fill out the rest of the registry. And so now he's just going to go to the end so we can kind of show you, once it's been submitted, the other thing that we're really working to help facilitate, facilitate um, this doctor approval uh, to validate your data. And this is the last module, at which point you get to submit it. Um, when you go back to your dashboard, it'll show that you now, the registry is still listed under your available questionnaire. Um, and if you open it up, it shows that it's pending approval. And again, that's just waiting for doctor's approval. This is a completely optional step. You don't have to send it to a doctor if you don't want to. Um, this is just something, like I said, it's to help us validate the data and just make it stronger when we go to publish and give out this information. Notice the point system, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so then by the other submitting thing... these, you get points. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the other thing is we're starting to implement a reward system. So as you fill out different questionnaires, different surveys that we have available, you're going to be awarded so many points. And after so many points, you're going to get an Amazon gift card and stuff like that. Because we really want to make sure that you guys are coming back. The idea of the registry, we want to collect longitudinal data. So anytime something changes, we want to get an update. We want to know, did a drug stop working? Did a new drug start working for you? Because um, this will really help us characterize what's going on with your children. Um, and then the other really cool thing is that you have a history where it'll pull up a PDF that shows everything that you submitted with that uh, questionnaire. Yeah, shows it, so. And this is something that you could keep for your files if you come back in six months to fill it out again and you want to know, well, what did I put you know, six months ago? Is it, was it the same? Has it changed? This will be available and then you can see what you filled out at that time and then update as necessary. So then the other thing is, like I said, it would be adding the doctor. So you'll see uh, on the dashboard there's now the option where you can add a doctor. And again, like I said, this is totally optional. A doctor can't add you as their patient. You are the only one who can add them. You can also change your doctor. You can remove them so they no longer have access to see your data. Um, so if your doctor isn't in the system, there's a way for you to send them an email, let them know they'll get an invitation, let them know that they have a patient who has joined the site and that their information is there and ready to view. If they're already in the system, you would just be able to select their name from the drop-down and then click Add Doctor. Um, and, then, yeah. and then they would now show up under your name as what your doctor is. And like I said, you can add more doctors, you can change the doctor, and uh, you can always remove doctors at any time. Exciting. And so then on the doctor side, this is another portion that we are working on. Um, and hoping to roll out very soon. Doctors, like I said, if they don't already have an account, they would send them the invitation. They would create an account similar to how anyone as a patient would create one. And then the only difference is that they would go and they hit the registry. Instead of filling out that membership form, they would fill out a doctor form. So this one is just a little bit different. It asks for information about who they're affiliated with, how many patients uh, are they seeing, uh, who have 8A, and then it's also going to ask if they want to be part of our doctor directory. And this is really just to help create a site where we can make sure that we are being as effective as possible in really reaching out to as many clinicians, physicians, uh, who are helping treat individuals with AA. And 
then once they have registered, um, As you may see, this is an example of how a doctor gets in their data to register in the database. And based on this information, we can have them in a repository for patients who need to select a doctor later on. And once they finish it, they can, uh, a patient can see these doctors, and doctors will be able to see patients who selected them previously. Um, if we go to uh, the, the doctor who, who has been selected by patient, well, by this patient account, we can see that if we go to the registry, doctors have this new feature, which is the doctor dashboard. And from here, we have uh, a simple application where they can select the patient who has selected them, and from there, if they already have um, PDA, um, registry submissions or any other questionnaires who have been submitted in the last month, they can click on here and get some uh, information about their submission. Um, this will also give the physician to, a chance to comment at any additional notes um, about uh, you know, specific seizures, if there is additional information that they feel might be relevant, they could add it in the comment box and then hit approve. And then once they hit approve on the patient end of things, um, when it said that you had a, a pending approval, it would then move down and show that it was completed and there's nothing else to do on that. Okay. All right. So that gives you an idea of what this is going to look like. Um, if you have feedback for us, let us know. Do you have those little things to match up? Oh, yeah. We do have some uh, old-fashioned ways of signing up. For any of the clinicians who are still here, we can, we've got some name and address forms for you to fill out so we can add you to our doctor directory if you're not already on it. Okay. So uh, oh, we better go back to these slides. So now I want to... Uh, oh, there was, if you notice, there was a button that said survey button on one of the menu, on the menu items on the live site. So that's what we had open for five weeks. And in five weeks, we got 80 respondents, which is really great. And now I'm going to review some of the uh, patterns and, and things we've learned from the respondents to, to our survey. We made the survey as easy as possible, short as possible, 26 questions. Um, and part of what this will do over time, we hope, is uh, the doctor-patient networks that we're building will be a record uh, for, for drug companies or people who want to, uh, companies that want to try new, uh, try new clinical trials, we'll have um, these networks that will indicate, and I've drawn a little schematic here, um, over time we'll see where we have um, um, numbers of patients and doctors that are treating scn 8 a which will make it easier to, to get these clinical trials out. And so here's the disclosure, as you already saw. Let me just give you an overview. We had uh, a range, age range of our respondents for their children, one year and one month, to 18 years, nine months, a mean of about five, five and three quarters years. Age at first onset of seizures, the mean was at 3.9 months, but stay tuned, you're gonna see that that's uh, conditional. Um, very interestingly, more males and females um, responded. And then when I looked at as much of the information I could find in our database of larger number of patients, that this ratio holds up, 57% males, and it's statistically significant. I've never seen this before. I'm not quite sure why we would have more males uh, who are at least being um, coming to us with SCNA day. Um, this shows you some of the, the, the spectrum of mutations that we've seen in our survey. There's about 77 of the 80 shown here. We didn't have time to add the last few. Um, you can see some of them. Uh, which one is the 
pointer. The top one, okay, good. So some of them are recurrent. So you can see there's six individuals here, there's five individuals here, eight here, five here, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing recurrent spots in the uh, gene, uh, even with our survey respondents. Now this is an interesting thing. We showed last year that um, the age of onset is kind of bimodal, where we had, um, in this case, um, upper 20, 28% of our respondents, the, the ch children had seizure in the, in the neonatal phase, so in the first month of life. We already heard that women have in, in utero uh, tremors and, and probably what might be called seizures. Um, so there's a, about a quarter or more of our patients um, have very, very early onset seizures, which is really unprecedented um, for this type of seizure. And then you see that um, there's a, a, good, a good portion. Last year I showed that this looked like a little bell curve over about uh, five months. Well, you're seeing that there's uh, an increase in the number of seizures uh, onset around three or four months. And then we get this new little blip out here around nine to 10 months. So I'm not sure this is a trimodal curve, but it possibly could be. And we'd like to know why there are patients with early, early onset seizures and some patients with later onset seizures. And we'd like to compare the phenotypes of these patients. The seizure frequencies vary extremely widely. So you'll see that um, this shows you a, a histogram. I've left the outliers. This is seizures per month. You can see out at the end of this is 600 per month, which is a huge number but we've left out some of the ones reporting up to 150,000 seizures a month. Um, the range uh, in the one I've shown here other than these outliers is two seizures a month to 620 seizures a month with a median of about 40 seizures, seizures a month from our respondents. Seizure semiology and the response to meds. Here you can see the various seizure types in general categories, generalized, partial, infantile spasms, febrile, you can notice that this is not um, Dravet syndrome and other. Um, what you see here is su uh, a surprisingly uh, high refractory rate, which is probably not surprising to us as family. However, if you noticed what Tracy said, there are about, no, was it, was it Tracy, did you say there, she already left, but um, <laughs> the, typically you'll see about 30% refractory for, um, if you survey epilepsy patients here, we're double that. So 71% of our, our children are refractory to one, two, three, four, five different medications. Uh, only 25% controlled, and interestingly, we have a few cases where there are no seizures at all. This is just uh, the response to how did medications, you, how did uh, the medications work for your child, and we did get this big Keppra peak here where it was made things worse or had no effect. Some of the sodium channel blockers here are having, you can see the blue colors, uh, improvement, and so I think you can see with if you blur your eye, you'll see that there's more shifting over to the sodium channel blockers, but not, extent, not exclusively by any means. Of course, this is very uncontrolled because all the kids are on different cocktails of, C, of AEDs. So for developmental skills, we asked, um, does your child have head control, manual dexterity, sit independently, walk, and speak? And you can see that, um, that we have about 70% um, that have head control, but that means 30% don't. That's pretty striking. Uh, because these are all for kids that are only two years or older. That's a very striking number. Um, for speaking, you know, uh, we have only about 16, that 16% 16 that can speak well, but 64% are nonverbal. Another very important feature for SCNA to epilepsy and encephalopathy. I'm just showing experience with alternative treatments. Um, you can see alternative diets like the keto diet where it, some, it was a slight majority that said yes versus yes for a while, but most said no. Uh, for a vagus nerve stimulator, we had a lot that said no, but there are only 10 respondents there, so that's seven people said no, two people said it helped, and yes, one said yes for a while. And then look at cannabis oil, which seemed very promising as an alternative treatment. So uh, we're doing re research in our lab on Miriam's model uh, that's been uh, talked about so much with CBDs and just beginning to do that work. We think it's very important to look at this in more detail. Um, so the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is the surprising thing that nobody's really seen before, and that is we asked the question, are there genotype-phenotype associations? And the question is, uh, if you have the same mutation with other patients, do you share more features with them, or, and are there differences between patients with different mutations? And so what I'm going to do is just point out, since we had five people in our survey uh, that were over two that, that had 850Q, 
and we had five that uh, had 1877. Um, I'm going to compare them head to head and see how they look. So here's the 850Q versus 1877. You can see the mean age is very similar. For the 1852, it was six years, two months. For 1877, it was five years, nine months. Notice seizure status, 850Q, 100% refractory. 1877, 100% seizure free for six months or more. Then you look at the developmental skills, and you can see that I didn't forget to plot the 850Q. There just aren't developmental skills. There's no head control, no manual dexterity, whereas in 1877, 100%. So these are striking differences. Notice that in the seizure onset, the 850Q seizure onset is much earlier than the 1877 seizure onset, which goes up to seven or eight months, and there's no overlap between them in these small number of samples. And the seizure types also differed. Notice that the seizure types for the 1850Q, 50% uh, of those patients have infantile spasms, whereas in the 1877, none did. So I think, you know, I'm gonna end, the, end it here. I just wanna say that it's very promising the kinds of things we saw in just a very brief survey, and that um, what promises even greater uh, return is getting this kind of return in terms of numbers of respondents for our longer survey, we will learn a great, great deal about what our children are suffering from and be able to communicate that to the researchers and the clinicians to better treat our children. And then this is something we can do right now. We're discovering things that are actionable right now. We don't have to wait for the next uh, new compound or drug to get on the market. And so you moms and dads really can make a big difference to treatment of our own children today. Thank you so much.